Welcome back. Uh, in the first part of the videos, um, Carlo explained some of the benefits of using Bayesian data analysis. Carlo mentioned how we can stay uh, clear of the replication uh, crisis if we think carefully before, uh, the flexibility of Bayesian modeling, and uh, why we want to avoid dichotomous thinking, amongst many other things. In this presentation, we will look at the nuts and bolts of Bayesian data analysis. We will give first a short presentation, but after the presentation, we will also work on an example. So let's start. Bayes' theorem states that the prior times the likelihood and data is proportional to the posterior. This means that we need to set priors and decide on a likelihood to use. Priors, we can set based on prior knowledge. And as you will see, there is always some prior knowledge. The likelihood, on the other hand, we decide based on epistemological and ontological arguments. But more of that later. In short, when we multiply the two, we get a posterior probability distribution. The posterior can be joint, that is, it can contain many parameters. What we have covered here needs to be formalized in a model specification. Model specifications can be written in different specification languages. If you look to the left, you see a model specified using the programming language Julia and the Turing library. In the bottom, we see a model specified in the programming language R using the package BRMS. Finally, in the top right corner, we see a model specified once again in R using the rethinking package. In our example, we will use the rethinking package. The main reason is that a rethinking package is very explicit in the sense that you need to be explicit about what you declare in your model. This will help us later on. In the middle, we see a model specification written in math notation. On the first line, the specification tells us that we have an outcome Y, which we assume is normally distributed. We want to estimate mu and sigma, that is the mean and standard deviation of this distribution. The second line is our linear mo model. We say that mu consists of a grand mean alpha, and then we have a predictor x, where we want to estimate a parameter beta, the slope. The following three lines simply set priors for each parameter we want to estimate. This might look confusing, but it will be slightly clearer when we work through our example later. So the first step we need to do is decide on a likelihood. That is to say, our assumptions about the underlying data generation process that generated the empirical data that we have collected. We ground our decisions when it comes to choosing a likelihood on epistemological and ontological arguments. Epistemological arguments are based on information theory, in particular, the concept of information or maximum entropy. We want to pick a distribution that will allow the data to tell us its story. In short, we want a distribution that has the maximum entropy given our data. Ontological arguments are empirically based. For example, if we have integers, a count going from zero to infinity, then we often model this natural phenomena using a Poisson distribution. Deductive falsification, as many of us have been taught, does not work here. Why? Well, many hypotheses correspond to one model, and one hypothesis can correspond to many models. So even when we think that data has falsified a particular model, some colleague will critique our data collection or our measurements in the end.
Bayesian analysis requires us to set priors on the parameters we want to estimate. If we use flat, uniform priors, we will maximum overfit. That is, we will learn too much from our data. And why is that a problem? Well, if we learn too much from our data, it will, the model will break down when it faces new data. We can always find some prior knowledge and very, common, very often common sense is a very good start. In the end, setting appropriate priors will allow the sampler to explore the multidimensional space more efficiently and effectively. We fall back on prior predictive checks. Later, we will do posterior predictive checks, but let's focus now on prior predictive checks. This is something we do before we have even sampled the models, and we do it to see what our priors imply on the outcome space. Sometimes this is also called sensitivity analysis. So if you look at the two plots to the right, the top plot shows common priors for the alpha and beta parameters of a linear model, while the bottom plot shows uh, priors that are more specific, you could say. What is clear here is that if we look at our lines in the top plot, you could see that it's like a sun. They're all over the place. They give absurd values. And the point here is that we would like to have the, the majority of our probability mass between the two dashed lines. This is clearly not the case in the top plot. If we instead look at the bottom plot, where we use more, um, more informative priors, then you can see that we have the absolute majority of our probability mass between those two dashed lines, but we still allow for absurd values, if you will. These are the type of things that we check when we do prior predictive checks. So we've decided that we need to pick a likelihood, our assumption about the underlying data generation process, but also that we need to select priors for the parameters that we want to estimate. Now is time to actually sample using our empirical data. In the previous video, Carlo mentioned that basis theorem can be seen as an engine that combines evidence with our assumptions to calculate a posterior probability distribution. We can use many algorithms as engines. In our example later, we will use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. This is the algorithm which the Stan language uses mainly. Stan is um, one of the most popular specification languages, I would say, when you're working with Bayesian models. Very many uh, software packages using STAN as the underlying platform for sampling. But many other type of engines exist, like grid approximations, quadratic approximations, and approximative Bayesian computation, and so on. Once we have sampled, we have lots of diagnostics at our hand if we use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. There are mainly three that are in particular important. The first one is R hat. R hat is uh, a measure of how well the sampling has worked to find a stationary posterior distribution uh, that we have found a true, in a sense, posterior probability distribution. It should never be above one point. 01. Effective sample size is uh, a measurement of the efficiency of the algorithm. That is to say that we get enough samples for each and every one of the parameters that we want to estimate, and it should always be in the hundreds. And finally, we have plots, in particular trace plots uh, that I will show later. 
But there are also other diagnostic divergences, so should always be zero. We have uh, BFMI, we have tree depth, and many other types of diagnostics. The point here is that we should always check these diagnostics because they are an indication if we can place any trust in our model. So once we've checked that the model passes all these diagnostics, it is now time to do some posterior predictive checks. Posterior predictive checks compare our model's predictions with the empirical data that we have. So once we've satisfied that we have a good enough fit, then we might be in a situation to either go for this model or improve it further. In the end, it's very common that we end up with many models that all have their strengths and weaknesses. And when we have all these models, we actually in the end need to also somehow compare them. And remember now, the comparison we're talking about here is a relative one. Which one is relatively best? Model comparisons have been done for decades. Many algorithms exist that can do model comparison. Uh, WAIC is probably the one that has been used the most the last decades. But lately, PSIS Lu, or simply Lu, has grown in popularity. And the reason is quite simple. Lu can do everything that WAIC can do, but it also has lots of diagnostics. So in the end, we might have come to the result that model number six, or whatever, is the best and we start to compute stuff from our posterior probability distribution. We are using that model's posterior probability distribution. And we can compute many different things, intervals, point estimates. We can plot the whole posterior probability distributions and not only look at the point estimates. And we can simulate, we can ask what ifs. Um, this is not something that we will go into much detail, the simulations in the example, but I'd like to stress that it's one of the key benefits, uh, even though it is a bit more advanced. If you're interested in knowing more about these things, then I would recommend you to read the book, Statistical Rethinking, where you have lots of exercises, where you have videos from Richard McElrath. We use that book in teaching at our university, so I would definitely recommend it. It's uh, the best book for introducing researchers to uh, Bayesian modeling. If you're more interested in the theoretical foundations, then I would uh, recommend James's book, Probability Theory, uh, but it is a bit heavy. If you're interested in reading a paper about model comparison, uh, the pros and cons of how we do model comparison today, I would recommend uh, Daniel Navarro's paper, Between the Devil and Deep Blue Sea. And uh, if you want to know more about likelihoods, The Common Patterns of Nature is the paper you should read. And then, of course, you have a number of links here to different libraries when it comes to specifying models or plotting model output and so on that I uh, recommend warmly. So, I guess now it's time for the example. <laughs>